Okay. Let's, uh, if, if everybody will, if you'll go ahead and, uh, oh, wait, let, let's, let, let me get through all the uh, technical difficulties here. Oh, we're no more. <laughs> Good. Um, if y'all will go ahead and mute, uh, mute your microphones and your video. Good. And so, um, Yeah, there you go. Microphones. Mute your video too. So the same thing as your microphone. Just click on the little, there we go. That's good. So if, uh, as we go, if you have a question, um, if you have a comment or something, just uh, type in the chat box and make sure that you're set to everyone. Um, and we'll address those questions as they as they come up. Uh, the only announcement announcement uh, for today's class is beginning today. Um, it's a new student. Uh, it's current student registration. As you were, new student registration starts um, next week. So um, uh, listen to Chef. Chef is wise. Um, while, while you, uh, most in this class, will be um, moving up, if you will, uh, to the upper class uh, classes, um, there's still the competition to get into classes. There's limited number of sections and limit, limited number of seats in each section. And so if you want if you want to be sure you get the classes that you desire, uh, that you want to take, that you need, um, the early bird gets the worm. And so if you wait, you'll be subject to whatever courses are available when you finally uh, take the time to register. So um, good. Thanks, Doug. A couple of you are uh, my advisees, and you should have received an email uh, last weekend. Um, for everyone else, you know, it really, it really doesn't matter who you reach out to, uh, to get registered, to get your schedule built, but you need to take care of it, um, as soon as possible. We certainly anticipate, um, returning in the fall back to face to face, um, at Cami in the brick and mortar, um, that South campus but um, summer is not going to change at all uh, for us in the culinary school. The only courses that are available dur during summer term are online classes. And so um, those are the only, uh, there aren't live face-to-face uh, -face classes to take during the summer. Um, we anticipate being back in the fall. So we are moving forward with traditional registration um, as, as if we're returning in the fall, because that's what we certainly expect to do. Um, get that taken care of as soon as you can. It, assuming you've got a little extra time at home, there's really shouldn't be a reason why you're not registered for the fall, uh, even by the end of this week. But um, know that new student registration starts next week, and there is a huge push. Um, you need to be aware of this um, historical fact. Schools like UAPTC, especially our side of the school, uh, the technical trade side of the school, um, in times when the economy is down, like the direction our economy is heading right now, um, there is a huge um, boom, um, uh, maybe for Pell Grant money, for uh, job changes, um, enrollment skyrockets. And that is going to add even more competition for every class that we offer. 
so much so that there may be more exceptions than the rule um, with advisors getting permission to override well, we'll let you in X, Y, Z class, even though you haven't taken the prerequisite yet, because there's no other room. Um, we want to get you in. You need to take a class. My point in all of this is just, I'm trying to emphasize, um, register now, uh, get your classes as quickly as you can and, you know, get your classes now, get a schedule now, and if we need to tweak and change and move classes around, um, we can look at that in the future um, as we need to. Uh, nothing's really changing here. Uh, we talked about this last week, uh, the few little changes in uh, moving some things around in um, the course schedule for the remainder of the semester. This week, um, the demo that I did, um, it will go up uh, this evening in Blackboard um, for uh, this current week. Um, I just deep fried, but we'll talk about all the fry stuff um, here in a little bit next week. Um, I will be demoing both smoking and uh, handmade pasta. Um, and just to let you know in advance, I don't expect anyone to smoke anything. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to ask you. I'm going to ask you to do either one, uh, whichever whichever you prefer. Um, some of you may want to do both. Um, in the in the meal that you make, you may want to smoke something and make some handmade pasta, and incorporate all of that together in one dish. That's perfectly good. That's uh, great. That's fine. But at the very least, handmade pasta can be made with a little bit of oil some eggs, um, some salt, and uh, flour. And so you don't, have to, um, you don't have to go buy a pork butt or some ribs or, or whatever. Uh, we will have a practical exam, um, and I will unveil all of the details of that next week. I gotta put together some instructions and, and whatnot. There'll be an alternative. Um, so you'll kind of have your pick of uh, one of two uh, things to do for your practical exam. Um, there you go. That's all I have to say about that. So let's talk about this week. Um, we're we're going to fry. What I did uh, was deep fry. And so um, I want to talk more about deep frying um, than anything else today. You can see on the um, screen in front of you some of the tools uh, that you need to deep fry. Now, in the demo that I did, I don't have a number two. Uh, maybe you do. Um, uh, Claire just asked a really great question, if everyone can see that. Um, there's, that's, you know what? No one's asked that question before, actually, Claire. I don't know if there is an easy master list somewhere for classes. I'm not sure what you see versus what I see. Um, and so let me, let me find out. Um, I've had, I had one advisee reach out to me over the weekend with the schedule that she wanted and she already knew, um, XYZ course was offered on this day at this time. And so I'm not sure where she got that. Um, so let me find out when I find out, I'll just uh, through blackboard email to your student account. I'll send a message to everybody um, where to find a schedule information. Um, I hope that's okay. It's best I can do for now. I, I, I look for schedules through, um, uh, through the portal, um, but I do it as an advisor. And so I know I'm clicking some buttons and seeing some things that uh, students don't see. I would imagine you log in the portal uh, somewhere um, after you've logged in. Well, I'm, I'm guessing, I'm assuming. So let's not do that. I'll find out and let you know. Um, I don't have a number two, so I deep fried in a number one. 
Um, let me let me express to you a little safety and caution. I'll probably repeat this uh, a couple of times uh, today, this morning. Um, for you to just put oil in a, a brazier, a stock pot, a saucepan, um, a tall sided saute, um, for, for you to just put oil and heat it up on the stovetop. Um, when you drop product, when you lay product into the, um, okay. Um, Zach, if you already had, I'm, I'm sticking to the eight volunteer events. If you had the eight volunteer events before the school shut down, then um, yes, I'm, we're, I'm gonna stick to that. But um, I emphasized, I don't think you made it last week. Um, there's no other volunteer opportunity. So the, the, the door is closed on that. Um, so if you didn't get the eight, um, you're taking the written exam um, or you get the zero for the exam. If you don't want to take it, um, that's up to you. But um, no, uh, there's no other volunteer opportunity. If you already got the eight, then uh, yes, Doug, I got yours. Um, if you already got the eight, then you're, you're straight. Um, if you didn't get the eight, you still get the extra credit for the events that you did volunteer and uh, had had signed. Um, so there you go. Um, I fried in um, a pot on the stovetop, but it's almost impossible to regulate the heat. And, you know, some product that you put in your, in your fryer has uh, water, some moisture attached to it. If you're pulling things from a freezer, um, you know, if you batonate some French, some potatoes to make French fries, you blanch them or par fry them and keep them in the, in the freezer. Uh, like we learned in food one and you take them out of the freezer, like any other frozen French fry and you put them in a, a stove top fryer, then um, you run the risk of, especially if that is too hot, um, it's fire hazard. So you, you just want to be extra careful. A tabletop fryer, a commercial fryer, obviously is uh, easier to regulate the temperature. It's thermostatic controlled. Uh, these other, other tools or things that you might, you know, have or have some alternate tools that uh, um, you can use when you fry. A few things to keep in mind, especially for deep frying. Um, season your product, uh, maybe except for potatoes. Um, season your product before it goes in the fryer. Never, ever, ever salt anything um, over a fryer. Uh, salt is one of the worst things for fryer oil. Um, it'll break it down and speeds up the degradation of fryer oil. This stuff is expensive. A lot of what I'm going to uh, refer to for the next few minutes has to do with maintaining the life of the fryer oil. Um, even if it's just a, a jug of canola oil uh, that you're putting in a saucepan for you to fry on your stovetop, um, you don't want to go through that whole um, two quarts or um, two quarts or half a gallon. Uh -huh. You don't want to go through that, um, use it just all that volume at one time and then waste, throw away whatever whatever's left over, uh, whatever you've used, get one single use out of it. Um, if y'all will remember food one, when we fried French fries and we learned the double fry method, um, we talked a little bit about extending the life of, um, <clears throat> okay, Lauren, are you, are you, were you raising your hand? Okay, maybe not. 
Uh, Claire, that's a good point. Um, an, an Insta Insta read thermometer, um, but yeah, that that you use uh, like in in a turkey fryer, those are thermometers for um, that kind of heat. You would expect your your fryer oil to be in the 375 degree ballpark, 350 to 375 degrees. And so even an insta read thermometer would be okay. You don't want to leave that insta read thermometer in um, all of the time. Um, Sean, right, a candy thermometer, um, that that works out okay as well. You shouldn't be re you shouldn't reach a temperature in the 475 or 500 degrees and maintain that temperature. If, if you do, then, you know, that's going to ruin just about any thermometer, even a, even a candy thermometer is not going to like uh, 500 degrees um, all the time, but you would have completely burned up the oil by then. Uh, Tara, we're going to talk about uh, different types of oil in just a minute. You would not want to fry deep fry um, with olive oil. Um, not at all. Okay. Um, the product that you are going to deep fry, um, make sure that it's, um, it's cut, it's sized in a way that it could, um, it can cook quickly. Uh, not real big thick pieces of, you know, if you've got, uh, Tyson chicken breast really, really thick on one side, you probably want to butterfly it. Um, you want to, you want to cut that down a little thinner. Um, you'll understand why as we go forward here in just a little bit, but, um, if it takes too long to cook into the middle, um, yes, yeah, Insta read, an Insta read thermometer was shown, a digital Insta read thermometer, um, um, is, is okay. Uh, you wouldn't want to just leave it in. And on that picture, the purpose of the Instaree thermometer is to check the temperature of the product you're frying, um, not for maintaining the temperature of the, of the oil. Um, I guess the expectation or the thought in that picture anyway is that um, one would be using a tabletop fryer and just like a commercial fryer, um, it, uh, it's uh, thermostat controlled. Um, yeah, potato chips as a side dish as we go forward, uh, it's probably going to be, it'd be okay. It's deep frying something. Um, and potatoes are cheap. Uh, the fat needs to be hot enough. The oil needs to be hot enough to seal the outside, um, of whatever it is that you're frying. Now this is in Celsius. So we're going to pause for a minute and you can do a little bit of math and convert the Celsius to Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit. You've got three seconds on your mark, set, go. So somebody, yeah, Sean, yeah, you, you already looked that up, didn't you? And that's exactly right, actually. Or did you just know that? 160 degrees Celsius is, <laughs> 160 degrees Celsius is 300 degrees, 320 degrees Fahrenheit and 190 degrees Celsius so I'm going to take one of Sean's bonus points away because actually 190 degrees Celsius is 374 degrees Fahrenheit. So uh, you lose one minus one point there, Sean. Hardy, R, R. Oh, rounded. Now, we've done kitchen math enough. You all have learned about the danger of, of rounding too much, right? Right? Just kidding. Yeah. You never want to fry anything at all um, below 320 degrees. And in fact, I'm still going to maintain. So I'm, I'm leaving the textbook. I'm leaving what you're going to read online if you Google deep frying. Um, 345 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, is as low as you want to go, and you'll see why um, in a minute. Never, ever, ever um, overload the fryer. Uh, there's just a whole bunch of reasons for that. Uh, you put a bunch of product in the fryer basket, and it's all packed together 
real tight, um, it's going to stick together, even if it's individually quick frozen and it's all loose in the fryer in, in the frozen bag. Um, you dump a huge truckload of shoestring French fries in a basket, completely fill it, drop that in. Um, you could be hard pressed to get all the French fries separated. Um, obviously, if you're going to fry a battered product, um, onion rings, mushrooms, and you just overfill the basket, um, it's all going to stick together. And now you have a blob of fried mushrooms. Um, you want to drain everything really well before you serve. That should be fairly obvious. If for no other reason than plate presentation. When you put that frozen or that fried product on the plate, if it hasn't been drained very well, you, you'll create an oil spill on the plate. That's not going to look right. That's not the professional um, uh, eye appealing nice plate that uh, you want to get. Um, we talked a little bit about this already, just the fryers themselves. You want to keep them clean. Um, even on the outside, the oil that, that cakes up, um, builds up over time. You don't want to just plop. Um, you don't want to just throw uh, food into the fryer. Um, the oil splatters, it, it's more of a mess to clean up. Oil on the, on the floor is a, a slip hazard. Um, oil that spills on you, even if it just splatters on your hand a little bit, um, it burns. Welcome to the industry. Uh, you get some burns from time to time. Uh, yes, Lauren, you can fry pickles if you want. I don't know by, why anybody would want to fry pickles. Why would you want to fry a decently good Oreo? Um, why do you want to fry a Twinkie? Why do you want to eat a Twinkie? Um, anything that you want to fry, you can fry. I know it's fair food, um, but uh, have you heard of the fried uh, Kool-Aid? Um, well, if you love fried pickles, you just go right on ahead with the fried pickles. But has, has anyone heard of the fried Kool-Aid? Um, all this fried food stuff at the fair started with the uh, Texas State Fair. Um, fried gumbo, that sounds decent. Fried Kool-Aid. Um, I've only tried this one time. It is a super sweet, makes the back of your mouth hurt, um, pretty nasty uh, donut, like a cake donut, but that cake donut is flavored with tropical punch Kool-Aid or grape Kool-Aid or pink lemonade Kool-Aid, whatever. Um, oh yeah, fried ice cream, it's good stuff. Um, I was curious. Um, I don't have a desire to try that anymore. I don't have a desire to go for the fried candy bars and um, stuff like that. In fact, um, a Milky Way that's kept in the refrigerator. So I'm going to go on the other end. Um, M&Ms that are kept in the freezer, really, really nice and cold, a little hard. I like that. Um, be aware of the foods that you are putting in the fryer um, in the baskets, in the oil, whatever goes into the oil. Uh, some foods may be a little mild flavor, like a white fish for the, for the demo, I fried some Pollock. And it's a mild flavored white fish. Any fish will incorporate, um, will change the flavor um, character of the oil. Um, catfish is mild flavored, but it has a very distinct flavor and that flavor is added to the oil. So uh, you have to keep that in mind. If uh, you're gonna do a fish, a fish fry, it's best, especially for a larger event, it is best to have a designated fryer for the fish and another fryer for everything else. Um, if you beer batter anything, no matter what the product is, um, the, the flavonoids from the beer affect the flavor character of the oil. And so you might want to consider a separate fryer uh, for that. Um, you have to keep that in mind. Dirty oil. Um, 
is terrible. We'll talk about stages of degradation, stages of oil here in just, just a minute. Um, that's a great question, Sean, and the short answer is no. Um, there's really not a concern about cross-contamination, uh, certainly not like uh, how we handle product on a cutting board um, around our workstation. You know, we definitely don't want to uh, prepare fish and then come right behind it on, on that cutting board with the same hands, blah, 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 and work with some vegetables, uh, let's say. But what's going in the fryer, because of the temperature of the fryer grease, um, remember, if, if we want to kill E. coli, we want to kill salmonella, um, we, we really need to, and in the fry world, we only need to reach 160, maybe 165 degrees to kill most anything. And so if you're frying, if you're holding your fryer at proper temperature, 350 to 375 degrees, you are almost instantly killing anything that would be considered a cross contaminant. Now, um, from an allergy standpoint, um, take Chick-fil-A, for example. Chick-fil-A fries in peanut oil. So um, you need to have the type of oil you use, we'll go to in just a minute. Um, you need to be aware of what makes that oil and the potential allergen that it may be. Um, so in your restaurant, in your food service, um, you may have to place some kind of warnings um, like Chick-fil-A uses peanut oil. Patrons with a peanut allergy need to avoid well, going to Chick-fil-A um, because everything is fried in peanut oil, um, depending on the severity of an allergy. Um, I had a, I had a, a client, I had a customer uh, who frequented the classes that I taught at the Rockefeller Institute on Petty Jean Mountain. And she was so allergic to um, red meat, lamb, beef. If, if we had to mark um, our fryer, um, fryer grease, if, you know, beef sticks or um, chicken fried steak was being prepared in this oil before we changed that fryer, um, we had to mark that so that she would not be affected by the cross contamination because she would be affected by um, whatever's left behind from uh, the beef in beef sticks, for example, or a chicken fried steak. Um, so those things do have to be, have to be kept in mind. Um, I don't have a whole lot of comment about it's better to cook things in oil or not. Obviously, um, some of you have taken or are taking, you will take healthy foods and nutrition from Mandy Smith and um, she, she'll teach you the right thing um, regarding that. Here is what happens when you drop something in the fryer. This is just a little brief overview of the science of what happens in the fryer. Um, it's all thermodynamics. Um, heat goes in and the cold goes out. As the heat is transferred in, um, heat conducts to the core of uh, the chicken nugget. Let's just put this um, for illustration, for argument's sake, we're gonna fry a chicken nugget. Um, and so you have the chicken, you've dredged it, uh, a little flour, a little egg wash, and some uh, some breadcrumbs, seasoned breadcrumbs. Probably season the chicken, season the flour, season the breadcrumbs. That goes in a 360, 375 degree fryer. Um, immediately, the first thing that starts to happen, um, the crust begins to form on the outside, uh, similar to the whole Maillard reaction that we have just beat up all semester, um, crusting forms. This is gonna be important and the temperature of the fryer grease um, controls this. The quality of the, of the grease does as well, but you want that crust to form 
Um, right on the outside, even if it begins as just a thin film, you want that to start right away so that not too much oil penetrates to the core of the product that you're frying. Um, that violent bubble that happens is the immediate evaporation of water. Um, remember, water is going to water is going to evaporate at below the boiling point. I mean, just past the simmer, um, or, or or just past um, a poaching stage. Even before you get to a simmer, you're already beginning to evaporate. Uh, see a little bit of steam um, uh, from water. Um, so you begin to evaporate at um, 170, 180 degrees. Um, and if that's the case, you drop something in at, or you place something in, we're not going to drop anything, right? You place something in at um, 375 degrees, evaporation is happening immediately. And that's the violent bubbling that happens when you first drop or place something into the fryer. It's that water vapor that's uh, being expelled, okay? As heat um, works its way in, um, water, the cold, works its way out. Um, and this heat transfer is exactly what makes deep frying a dry cooking method. Um, that's kind of the basic science. Uh, there you go. We want the fryer uh, to be at the right temperature. Um, you, we uh, basically covered all of this. If the, if the temperature is too low, then that crust doesn't form right away. And more and more oil uh, penetrates um, the crust, in some cases all the way to the core. That's when you get some uh, fried product that's just a grease sponge. It's going to be one of two reasons. Most of the time, it's because the temperature's too low. Um, it doesn't cook fast enough. It doesn't crust right away. That's the problem. But um, the te if the temperature of the oil is too low, all of that oil and grease is going to soak inside, and then you're going to eat it, and it's not very, not very pleasing. Um, here's the oils, and you can see um, the on the Fahrenheit side, the smoke point refers to the temperature at which that oil burns um, and will smoke. Um, it, the temperature is too high for that oil to be useful anymore. Um, it, you've scorched it. Um, and you can see extra virgin olive oil. Um, and this is off really just a little bit because uh, uh, the good high quality extra virgin olive oil, the smoking point is generally around 275 degrees. Um, some sources say 295 degrees. This chart says 331 degrees which is still uh, too low to deep fry. Um, I, I know that we had a, a chart earlier, um, we, we mentioned 320 degrees, but um, really you need to be in the 350 to 375 degree range to properly deep fry. And so there's all of these other, other oils. The next one up, the olive processed is not extra virgin. Um, the extra virgin olive oil is pure squeezed olives. Nothing else has been done to them. And so any other type of olive oil or any other grade of olive oil beyond extra virgin has been processed and the smoke point goes higher. That is an oil though that is so expensive that you certainly wouldn't want to deep fry with it. But to pan fry, to stir fry, um, where you're using a much smaller amount of oil, absolutely. Um, why not? Uh, you see this word up here. Look at the very, very top. There's sunflower 
high oleic acid, um, oleic, high oleic oil. And so those three, it's oleic acid is what it's referring to. And those three that are listed there, the safflower high oleic, the canola high oleic, and the sunflower high oleic. High oleic acid, uh, high oleic oil is oil that replaces um, what used to be trans fat oil. Um, the FDA, the USDA, um, has required that manufacturers remove trans fats out of things. And so these, um, Claire is a great question. So the generic vegetable oil falls in the sunflower, coin, corn, and soybean oil uh, world. Um, safflower, soybean, corn, sunflower um, are specific vegetable oils. Um, the generic vegetable oil is more or less um, an amalgamation or a combination of these oils. It is more generic, but it falls in this same range. And so a uh, generic vegetable oil is about a 450 degree smoke point oil, which is perfectly high enough to put into your commercial um, uh, deep fat fryer as well as your tabletop fryer. Um, high oleic oils. Um, so trans fats are all saturated fats. And so um, high oleic oils are higher in monounsaturated fat. And so they're supposed to be healthier. Um, I feel funny saying healthier in the while we're talking about deep frying because uh, you know I don't know a whole lot that's healthy about uh, French fries. I know I love them a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, but um, I love this too. Today is brought to you know um, that's uh, I don't like a lot of things that are healthy. I guess. Smoke point the, is the place where it's all burned up. So certainly if you can be, you know, 75 to 100 degrees below this smoke point, um, that's, that's going to be ideal for extending the life of the oil. You never want to push it all the way. Um, you never want to push it, the oil all the way to its limits and think about um, or expect that it's gonna hang around for, uh, for a long time. So I know this is maybe a little bit hard to read, um, but we've got uh, five stages of oil. And so when you first open up a contain container and introduce oil um, to your fryer, uh, stove top, table top, or commercial, a stand fryer. Um, it's going to be fairly, really clear. There's no odor to it. Uh, there's no flavor added. There's really no uh, character to it other than it does the job of frying. And so you get a nice crispy crust. Um, and, and that's that. Um, the color can still be um, really light from that oil. The best is oil that has been used, uh, let, let's say a restaurant that has fryers running all day long, um, a fryer that's run a couple of days. So, so the oil, kind of like this COVID-19, there's, there's this curve. You can think of brand new oil and we start to use it pretty quickly. It develops some character and now it is good oil. It reaches a peak. And we want to do all we can to maintain the oil at that peak. And so a couple of things. One, filter, 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 filter. Number two, filter, filter, filter. You get the idea. Number three, filter. Number four, filter. After, now I was going to say after every use, certainly, we don't turn off a fryer and we filter the whole fryer on the restaurant line 
after every basket of, of French fries or chicken nuggets or spring rolls or whatever it is that you're, that you're frying. But at the end of, um, at the end of every shift, you definitely want to filter. We want to get all the little parti particulates, all the, um, well, um, so, so uh, Doug asks a, a really poignant question. Um, Doug, make sure that you're, uh, right now you're sent uh, um, under two, it says probably just me. Change that to everyone so everybody can see the question. Doug just asked, does unused oil go bad from non-use? And the short answer is yes. Um, just like anything else, you can buy some canned green beans and put them in the back of your cupboard and um, leave the green beans there for uh, a month, three months, six months, a year. You come back in five years and the can's all bulging. Uh, nobody opened it. You know, it was processed and sealed for extended um, storage and whatever. Um, yes, it can go bad. Vegetable oil especially is made from vegetable. You know, it's processed, but still everything has a shelf life. And so it can go bad. The, what degrades uh, cooking oil um, quicker is its use. And it's the effect of heat, cool, heat, cool, heat, cool. Um, every time it's heated, so if you're heating the oil to deep fry, and this will be exactly what, what um, if, if you don't use the filter. Okay, so if you don't filter, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't mess up the fryer. It doesn't mess up the machine. What it does is degrade the oil. Um, you leave product there in the oil. Now, in a fryer that is used every day, um, the extended um, presence of those, the breading, for example, the little crumbs of breading that remain in the oil, um, they burn. And that quickly, we, we leave that peak, we leave the curve, and we end up all the way to stage five really, really quick. Um, uh, that's right, Sean. There is nothing mechanical. Um, there's nothing mechanical at all about a fryer. It's a there's a thermostat. That's probably the the most complex technology, and that's not really very complex. Thermal couple, um, and there's an on off button, um, and there's a, there's a heating element um, or a burner. And uh, that's pretty much it. It's just a vessel to hold, um, just a vessel to hold the uh, the oil that you're frying, that you're using to fry. So um, if you will, if you'll remember, wasn't that long ago that we were all together at Cami in the multi-purpose room, our classroom? We have one fryer with two sides four baskets at a time and it takes one and a half of those 35 pound containers of of grease to fill up one side so to fill up that uh the fryer that we have in the multi-purpose room um takes three of those 35 pound containers and those are 150 uh, they've been going up, so they're closer to $175, $180 a piece. You see how quickly just the money adds up and the need to extend the life of the, of the fryer. So we want to filter out all of those, those particulates that are left during a shift. Um, <clears throat> you don't want to leave the fryer on all night long. Part of your closed down checklist in your, in your restaurant should include make sure the fryers are turned off. In fact, it ought to be just standard operating procedure. 
the end of the shift, you break down the fryer, meaning you filter it, you clean it, you wipe it, you clean out all the, the dust, the, not the dust, but the particulates and stuff at the bottom of the fryer, ba uh, the fryer itself. You get all of that out. Um, then you refill the fryer, turn the whole thing off. Um, then the next shift, they kick it back on. If that's part of your practice, you're not constantly heating, cooling, heating, cooling. That also adds to the deg degradation of the oil. Water breaks down the grease, degrades the grease. And so everything that you put in the, in the fryer from frozen, you are incorporating water. Um, you want to pat dry the chicken, the fish, um, anything that is going before it's breaded, um, anything that goes in the fryer to, to minimize as much as possible the amount of water. Salt breaks down the grease and you quickly get to a stage four just because you're gonna, you're gonna salt. You take those French fries out of the, the grease, you drain the basket a little bit, and while it's still wet so that the salt sticks to it, you're gonna salt uh, those French fries right over the, um, the fryer grease. Doesn't take much of that salt. Um, to get into and incorporate with uh, the fire, fryer grease and it'll start breaking it down. So that's good to know because it does, if you season real heavily, um, your handmade chicken nuggets before you put them in the fryer, the presence of salt adds salt to the, um, to the fryer. No, uh, pepper um, doesn't. Rebecca, pepper doesn't uh, doesn't work the same way as salt does to the the fryer grease. That's a good question. It's a good point, um, but it is a foreign um, object that will cook in the grease. And so, just like the breading, um, that pepper will burn as well and will end to a stage uh, four or a stage five. Uh, stage four is where you need to be ordering um, fryer grease from your purveyor um, and be ready to change it. Stage five, it's gone. Um, you need to change it. Late stage four and stage five, um, even if the, the fryer grease won't get all the way to temperature, and so your fryer is gonna run more um, which is going to burn up your gas, but um, because it's hard to get and stay at temperature, um, it's also going to incorporate a lot of grease. And by this stage, it's nasty tasting grease. That's what your that's what your hush puppies are going to taste like, or um, whatever it is you're frying. You're going to make uh, um, onion rings, and they're going to taste like nasty oil. I don't want that. <clears throat> oh, well, um, I'll, I'll put this, uh, Claire, I'll, I'll put this PowerPoint online as well, and you can go back and review. That's going to be um, essential, I think, so you can, you can zoom in and, and see that. Um, you know, you can also move um, wherever – Wherever my picture is, you can drag, uh, you can drag me out of the way. Um, so this week, while I'm focusing on deep fry, um, really the theme of the week is fry. And so you see deep fry, shallow fry, which is in a pan. Um, you see pan fry with those uh, sausages. And you see uh, stir fry. All of that fits in this whole world of fry, and that's using using some oil um, in in different amounts and high temperature. Um, and so, here's another way of just looking at it from the standpoint of the amount of oil in a pan. Um, I would uh, strongly caution. Um, if you're going to deep fry, um, Doug, that's a great question. 
and I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be honest and not make an assumption. I really think that um, air fry, for our purposes in classical definitions of uh, cooking methods, air fry is baking. Um, air fry is baking with um, uh, convection because as I understand the air fryers, it's a uh, high temperature circulating air. So really all it is that they, they made a convection oven into a smaller device that's about the size of a crock pot. And that's the technology. And um, here you go. We're going to slap a name on it and call it an air fryer. And ooh, that's now all the rage because it's a healthy way of frying. Well, it's not frying at all. Um, I don't think there's any oil in an air fryer. Um, I could be wrong. Maybe a couple of y'all have an air fryer and can, can correct me. Um, and, uh, Hey, I, absolutely. I, and I wish there really was a little mail slot or something that you could just, especially if Rebecca is going to make fried chocolate pies, um, you just put that, that chocolate pie in the little, uh, in the little mail slot on your screen to, um, uh, send it my way. And that's a, that's a perfect fry to do right there. Make you a chocolate fried pie, send it to Moralton. That's where I am. Yeah, Doug, no oil. So, so really, uh, an air fryer isn't for our purpose here, talking about classical technique and methodology. Uh, fry has oil. Air fryer is a convection oven. Um, and so people for a um, hundred years um, or more, as long as there's been an oven in somebody's home, uh, somebody would deep fry French fries and somebody wants to be a little healthy and they would bake the French fries and um, you bake it enough until they're crispy for a minute. It's still just a baked or roasted uh, potato um, in an oven. So I, that's, that's what I believe. That's my understanding. And um, okay, Lauren, just, uh, she's wanting me to hurry up, I guess, cause you keep saying, uh, you know, fried Oreos, Lauren talked about the hush puppies. You're making me hungry. So uh, we'll move along. <clears throat> There's two methods. Um, when we deep fry basket method, swimming method should be pretty self-explanatory basket method. Um, that is putting product directly in the basket and then lowering the basket down in the grease. The swimming method is lowering the product directly into um, the oil. Um, you can see, um, I can't tell on my screen very well if that's fish or um, I, I can't tell what this, this person is frying, but they have a hold of it. And you can see that candy thermometer in the background they're using to, we were uh, discussing earlier, um, they're using to maintain the control, uh, maintain the temperature of uh, their fryer grease on the stovetop. My demo was, was similar. I just I don't have a candy thermometer. But um, I show you in the demo a uh, swimming method with shrimp. Um, I'm doing some beer battered shrimp. and uh, when you, you swim the product in the oil, um, in that hot grease. So you don't just plop it in. Um, you kind of swim it back and forth till you start to see that crust form. It should happen in just a second or two. And then you kind of lay it in. I say drop, but it's, um, you really just lay it in. That's the swimming method. Okay. Um, when you initially drop stuff, drop stuff in the oil, you see all these bubbles. And now I would imagine you can even see the color with these potatoes you see on the left hand side of your screen when you deep fry. That's not really very violent, but um, I, I believe I would imagine most of you has fr have fried things in the past, and you know what I'm talking about. You initially drop something in that hot grease, that hot oil, and um, 
that grease talks to you, it gets a little angry. Um, as it cooks, go back, uh, go back to that picture of the thermodynamics, the science of what's happening, the heat transfer, um, the water being taken out, the bubbles start slowing down, the product floats to the top. These are the signs that that product is finished or nearing uh, finish. Um, that's what the purpose of the InstaRead thermometer was um, on that tool list from before. If I think the product is almost done, the, boil, the, the, the bubbles um, have slowed down, the product is floating, I can check it with the thermometer and uh, see if it's at the temperature that I want it to be. Okay, let's talk about this week um, and uh, what maybe, uh, what, what you should or, or can do uh, this week. I want to see, now those of you that have already done last week's, and, and I know it took a while to get uh, the lab, the demo stuff loaded in the blackboard. Um, there aren't due dates. This all needs to be completed by the end of the semester. Some of you have done, and I appreciate that. Um, uh, I, I think I have this down a little bit better um, so that it works, uh, will work faster. I should have this stuff in today, um, not like uh, waiting another two or three days to get this up. And if you did do this last week already, then you notice from what I told you, versus what I actually uploaded, the lab A and lab B was a little bit backwards. Well, I fixed that now. So I still wanna see uh, a picture of your mise en place. Um, and I'd, I'd like to see, let's focus on uh, this week, your mise en place at the stage where you are ready to cook. So all of your chopping and slicing and dicing, all of your weighing, um, everything is, is done. A few of you uh, put up pictures of all of the product that you were, you're going to use versus, remember, mise en place is your prep. Mise en place is going through all those steps of weighing and measuring, chopping and slicing and dicing, and organizing what you are going to cook. Here on the slide in front of you is the mise en place ready for um, a stir fry. And so you see the wok on the side. I'm more interested in seeing the food part of your mise. Um, um, yeah, let me just see your food. Um, you don't necessarily have to show me your pots and pans and bowls and cups and tongs and things like that, okay? Um, here's a stir fry. Here is, uh, they're gonna fry some chicken. And so um, all of the product that they're gonna need to make uh, fried chicken. So I wanna see your mise, I wanna see um, your finished product, uh, whatever it is. Um, plated and you in uniform um, holding your presented product plated. Um, be mindful of color. Um, be mindful of the architectural design of your plate. Create some height. Have variation in um, textures and colors and um, height and feel of the whole plate. Don't be afraid of negative space. Um, we still should be leaning more and more on less on the plate is more. Um, Certainly from a health and nutrition standpoint, there should be more uh, vegetable product than there is meat. Even though, especially in this country, that meat, the protein, is the main feature of the plate. Um, just uh, do your best with those things and we'll gradually, week after week, um, improve and make your best even better. Um, was a lot to digest, um, the PowerPoint, as well as this recorded um, 
video will be put up. Um, it will be put up later today. Uh, what questions do you have? Concerns? Bueller? Bueller? If there are no questions, um, again, practice safe social distancing. Um, be safe, be healthy, be happy. Yes, sir, the task this week will be frying. Um, and so frying is the focus. Um, I focused for this, uh, this presentation, this lecture, and the demonstration that I did, I focused on deep frying. Um, if we were at Cami um, face to face, we would have had a fish fry um, this week. And so I had a fish fry. Um, I want you at home to fry. I didn't get into, um, that's right, figure out a way to get me the fried uh, chocolate pies. There might even be bonus points in there for that. Um, so you can, I, I, I would like you to stay away from the pan fry uh, per se, just because that is really uh, searing. And so we've done that. We've done that a few times, a few different ways. I would like you to deep fry. I would like you to shallow fry. The, the difference between deep fry and shallow fry is uh, a deep fry, there is enough hot oil to completely submerse the product in the oil. Shallow fry is uh, more like, you know, stewing and braising. Stewing, completely cover. Braising, uh, you know, you cover the product half, two-thirds of the way, but some of that product is, is outside of the liquid. Deep fat fry is completely submersed. Shallow fry is about halfway, um, or stir fry. Stir fry is a very quick cut, a uh, quick cook, um, and it is uh, almost exclusively, unless you do some fusion uh, cooking, some fusion food by ingredient choices. That's pretty. That's Asian, um, and that's fine. Um, but to properly stir fry. Um, again, if we were at Cami and we were going to stir fry, we have enough woks uh, to do that. But um, fry, just, just just fry something. What else? Is there anything else? If not, be safe, be happy, be healthy, and um, I'll see y'all again uh, probably next week. You can uh, exit if you'd like. Um, again, like before, I'll hang ar around for a few minutes. If uh, you want to go ahead and leave the meeting, that's fine. And if you want to hang out and chat about anything, um,